Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you might be watching this video Bible study, it is good to be able to study God's Word with you again today. And today we're going to continue working our way through some of the accounts that we find in the first half of Holy Week. As we begin our study, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we study your word and walk with you to your cross, lead us to marvel again and again at the extent of your love. Amen. Do you have a bucket list? You know, one of those things that you want to do before you kick the bucket? Maybe you have an actual list written down, or maybe it's just more of a mental list of things that you'd like to do. Places you'd like to see, experiences that you'd like to have before your life comes to an end. Here's the hard part. We don't normally know when our life is going to end, so we don't know how much time we have to get the bucket list done. That's kind of the interesting part about Jesus' life. As true God, he knew exactly when his life was going to come to an end. And what did he decide to do with that time? Well, he did not distance himself from his disciples who continue to make some, let's face it, pretty ignorant and selfish comments to Jesus. He didn't hide away in a cave somewhere, not to be bothered by uh, other people as he prepared for his death. He didn't even avoid his enemies. Instead, we find Jesus spending time with people, people that loved him and people that hated him, all people that he loved and was willing to die for. This section of God's word is going to take us to Tuesday of Holy Week. So Jesus had returned to the temple in Jerusalem on Monday, and upset by what he saw, he let the people know it. At the end of that day, he re returned with his disciples to that small town of Bethany, which was about a mile to the east of Jerusalem, and you would have to go through the Mount of Olives and Bethphage to get there. And that's when we start reading in Mark chapter 11, verse 20. In the morning of Tuesday, as they went, that is Jesus and his disciples, went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Now, last time I told you to stick that fig tree outside of Bethany in the back of your mind and that we would come back to it later on. Well, now it's later on. Remember that on Monday morning, as Jesus was leaving Bethany to go to Jerusalem, that he was hungry. He went over to a fig tree and found that although it was full of leaves, it had not produced any figs. Simply put, the fig tree was not doing what it was supposed to do. And so Jesus said out loud for his disciples to hear as well, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. It was the next day, and Jesus and his disciples walked past this fruitless fig tree. And the disciples were now amazed at what they saw. In just 24 hours, the fig tree had withered from the roots, meaning that this fig tree would never produce fruit again. Now, does that seem a little harsh to you? It almost might feel like Jesus was just taking out his foodless frustration on this helpless fig tree. However, this really wasn't about a growling stomach and a fig tree. Jesus had some lessons to teach his disciples with this fig tree. Just as fig trees are expected, I know, to produce figs, so also Christians are expected to produce fruits of faith. That is evidence of their trust in their Savior God. And just because a fig tree looks healthy with a whole bunch of, of leaves on it, 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 it needs to produce figs in order for it to be considered a fig tree. So also a person who may appear very religious and claims to be one of God's people, but does not trust in God's word and follow it. That person is, is not one of God's people. Now think of what Jesus' disciples had witnessed the day before when they went with Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. It was packed full of people who appeared very religious, claiming that they were God's people. But the reality was that they didn't trust God's word and they did not follow it. They were merely a bunch of leafy fig trees without any figs growing on them. And Jesus, he wouldn't allow that to go on forever. Judgment would come on them just as it had come on that fruitless fig tree. And that judgment would be permanent and it would be final. 
Now, what was the point of Jesus doing this? Jesus didn't want that for his disciples. Jesus didn't, he didn't want that for his enemies. Jesus doesn't want that for any one of us. And therefore, he gives us this warning of the fig tree. And then he goes on to further explain, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says this to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus begins this section with something that seems so simple and maybe even obvious, but I think more times than not, it is lost in discussions about faith. Jesus says, have faith in God. It is the object of faith that is most important and impacts us. You see, faith is reliance. It is dependence upon someone or something. Christian faith is depending on the God of the Bible, and trusting that his promises are true and his word is worthy of following. Even if what God says seems to be impossible to us, like being able to move a mountain into the sea, faith trusts that God is capable of doing it if he says that he's going to do it. Now, let's be clear. Nowhere in the Bible does God say that he promises to throw mountains into the sea. But if he did, hey, we would believe that God could and would do it. So what does God promise us in the Bible? Well, he does promise to answer every one of our prayers. And therefore, what does faith do? Faith trusts that God will answer our prayers as he has promised to do in the way that he knows is best and also at the time that he knows is best for us. God also makes it clear that he, he wants us to forgive those who sin against us just as he daily and repeatedly forgives us who sin against him in thought, word, and action. To pray to God while refusing to forgive someone, that's going to be a hindrance to faith and to prayer. We ask that God help us to forgive others, trusting that what he asks us to do is good for us and for other people. And that's what faith does. Faith in God trusts God and his powerful word to do what he says and to fulfill his every promise. Sadly, the disciples witnessed in the temple religious leaders who claimed to trust God, but the fruits of trust were not there. They thought they knew better than God, that God could not be completely trusted. And as strange as that might seem, it, I think it's probably a temptation for us as well. Are there ever times where we try to divorce trust and faith from following and listening? Oh, we claim to trust God, but then question what he says about forgiving others freely because ooh, bitterness and vengeance makes so much more sense to us. We claim to trust God but are hesitant to give him complete control of our lives because we think we might know what is better for ourselves than God does. Faith and following, they go hand in hand. And that faith begins with recognizing our failures to follow and then trusting that God forgives us for those failures. And it is in that full forgiveness of every sin that we have received from Christ that then enables us to be fruitful Christians, honoring God by being who God has made us to be. In Luke chapter 21, we're told this. Each day, Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. Jesus' routine throughout these, this first half of Holy Week is, I always find it kind of remarkable. He only had a, a few days before he would be betrayed, arrested, crucified, and died. But he wasn't trying to quickly, you know, check off items on his bucket list of experiences he just had to have or places he just had to visit for the first time. Each day he went to Jerusalem and to the temple to be around people. In fact, Jesus' purpose for coming into this world was really all about people. He came to bring people to believe in him as their savior, and 
He wanted to reach as many people as possible. His desire to be among the crowds in Jerusalem is, I think, even more remarkable when you think of what Jesus found on Monday when he had gone to the temple. He found people that hated him and were planning on killing him. That might have been the, the last place you would ever expect Jesus going back to, but he went back daily because he wanted even his enemies, those who wanted him dead, to depend on him for their salvation and to spend eternity with him. Over the next couple of weeks, we're, we're going to see what Jesus experienced and who and what Jesus taught while at the temple on those days and the reactions that he got. And I think that you might be surprised at times. But what is not at all surprising to us is Jesus' interest in people. We have a Savior who is interested in people, in you and me and every person. There is no one that he does not want to be with him in heaven. There is no one for which he was unwilling to live and die for. And Jesus calls us to do the same. So is there someone in your life that you find difficult to love? Someone that you're struggling to forgive? Someone that you're having trouble with bitterness and anger towards? Let's remember Jesus' words. Have faith in God. Trust that God has given his son Jesus to die for your sin and the sins of all. See his loving interest for every soul and then give to others as you have received from God. That's where we're going to stop today. Have a great rest of your day and hope to be able to worship with you this weekend, whether that's online or in person here at Star of Bethlehem. Have a good week and we'll see you next time for some more Bible study.